In today's lecture, I am focusing on the properties of synapse. And uh, this is one of the important aspect in understanding the various uh, synaptic events and uh, the synaptic physiology, pharmacology, and the clinical aspects. Without consuming much time, this is the part one I was uh, I mentioned in the last uh, last before last class, wherein I covered the definition and nature of transmission and the types of synapse. In the previous class, I talked about the vesicular transport mechanism and on the neurotransmitters. Today, I will be dealing with the properties of synapse and the clinical aspects. Briefly, synapse is a specialized junction where transmission of information takes place between a nerve and another nerve or a muscle or a gland. That is between a nerve and a nerve, nerve and a muscle and a nerve and a gland. And these are the parts of the synapse. We have the uh, three different parts, the pre presynaptic terminal, postsynaptic site, and the synaptic gland. And the presynaptic terminal, uh, the important uh, things, the active zone, the vesicles, the mitochondria, the microtubules, and uh, what is not shown here is the, the calcium, uh, voltage-gated calcium channels and various proteins associated. In the postsynaptic cell, we have the receptors and the uh, receptor um, uh, either destroying or metabolizing enzyme and uh, the uptake mechanism, presynaptic uptake mechanism. A synaptic cleft is a, a space which is uh, filled up with the protein, neurexins, what are called the neurexins, uh, trying to limit the dispersion of the, uh, the, the, the neurotransmitter uh, coming from the exocytosis. This is uh, briefly about the definition and the parts of the uh, synapse. Now, I, I mentioned about uh, the various uh, sequence of events uh, happening during synapse because uh, this one I am keeping it uh, uh, again and again because this is a very often or very frequently asked question. So one, I just mentioned what are the events happening the arrival of impulse from the in the presynaptic terminal, opening up the voltage gated calcium channel, then the calcium influx, the calcium trigger, the, the calcium entry triggers the uh, vesicle associated membrane proteins, then vesicles move to the membrane, and then they produce exocytosis, and subsequently they undergo the recycling. The neurotransmitter release derived from the exocytosis will disperse in the synaptic cleft and uh, will reach the receptor site and then they will have a, a neurotransmitter and receptor interaction. The neurotransmitter and receptor interaction opens up the ion channels directly because there are ion tophoretic channels and some are ligand gated channels. Either they activate the antiphorotic channels or ligand gated channels or metabotropic channels. And uh, especially antiphorotic and ligand gated channels, they produce the postsynaptic potentials, either excitatory or inhibitory, that is EPSP or IPSP. Then that produces the uh, action potential in the postsynaptic membrane. These are the various events, the nine events I have uh, made. The properties of a chemical synapse. I name them one, it is a one way conduction that unidirectional. There is a delay in transmission and they are fatigued. They are easily fatigued and uh, there is a sort of a excitation or inhibition by production of the potentials, what are called the postsynaptic potentials. That's one of the property of the synapse. Then uh, the, the the responses are summated, whether it is excitatory or inhibitory or summated. There are uh, different types of synaptic inhibitions and um, the synaptic transmission or synapse facilitates or desensitizes the um, transmission. And there is a, what is called a mechanism of occlusion and subliminal fringe. 
the synapse they will converge and diverge so that means they will be so then we have a synaptic plasticity that means uh, changing to the requirement of our uh, activity the brain activity that means as we are growing we are learning new things the new things have to be stored and the old things uh, have to be kept back in the track so this is synaptic plasticity sometimes we lose certain neurons those uh, neurons have to be uh, re re made revitalized or uh, taken by the uh, somebody somebody else and this synaptic plasticity is achieved by the long term depression and long term differentiation so these are the various things i would try to cover up the the entire uh, uh, things is uh, vast but uh, you can just uh, keep all these things in your um, because once i share the uh, once i share this uh, uh, presentation then you will have this thing in with you uh, at any time now coming back uh, i i now discuss one by one one by one one way conduction one way conduction especially the one way conduction is the property of the chemical synapse so if you are looking at the chemical synapse here this is a chemical synapse i have made wherein this is a presynaptic terminal you have the vesicle there and this vesicle ruptures and that releases the transmitter so that means this is in this direction from the presynaptic terminal to the postsynaptic these things because the transmitter is released here and this transmitter in transmitter interacts with the the receptors located on the postsynaptic side and brings about the action so thus it is unidirectional so whereas in case of a electrical synapse it may be bidirectional because it is the the resistance membrane resistance by the gap, gap junctions that would do this thing so this is a one way direction that means that is good suppose the information going to the brain should go to the brain it should not be lost or it should not come back to the, come back to the uh, skin or the muscle or the organ from which it is originated then number 2 is the synaptic delay there is a time taken uh, there is a uh, a definite time is taken from the arrival of impulse here to the production of the impulse there that means i have mentioned uh, there are three things happening one the uh, conversion of electrical energy to chemical energy then from the chemical energy back to electrical energy these are the two important uh, transducing the mechanisms operating here in the synaptic plant so now if you are uh, so to to achieve that there should be some time a definite what i say a finite time finite time is required to achieve these things if you are looking at that what is, what is that finite time is for so if you are looking at uh, this time is taken for uh, the the impulse opening up the voltage gated channel then the voltage gated channels the calcium influx the after the calcium influx there is a vesicular movement the vesicular movement uh, come to the the member active zone of the uh, free synaptic terminal and uh, uh, produce exocytosis this is the release of neurotransmitter now the neurotransmitter disperses in the synaptic cleft because synaptic cleft as far as the neurotransmitter molecule is concerned it's a, it's a sea it's a sea of um, uh, a revolution of uh, space so that means uh, the, there is a fluid there the extracellular fluid and they where the neurotransmitters are released because of the brownian movements because of the concentration there is a diffusion of these gases and another thing the release is an explosive release so that they will reach to the receptor site so now the nucleus uh, neurotransmitter and the receptor they uh, interact and that produces uh, either opening of the ion channel if it's a interferotic neuro neurotransmitter or if it's a ligand gated neurotransmitter it will uh, open up the uh, channel through the ligand uh, mediated mechanisms so that produces the the epsp the excited postsynaptic potential and then the excited potential at the postsynaptic side and this usually takes between uh, 0.3 to 0.5 milliseconds 
it is maybe 0.5 millisecond suppose if you are if you are using this uh, synapse uh, very 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 frequently there may be what is called a, a plasticity that means it will reduce the time event of the transmission whole thing gets uh, uh, gathered as if uh, we, we start doing uh, exercise then our body is toned up Sim similarly here the synaptic activity as you keep doing as you keep reading and learning so that would uh, reduce and you will become quick and smart process of uh, synaptic transmission if you are looking at uh, these these one two three six maybe more i mentioned i mentioned all these six items each one of them require energy that is atp say for example the opening of the calcium voltage gated channel calcium channel the vesicular transport the release of neurotransmitter then uh, the interaction and uh, that is keeping up the receptors intact and the genesis of these things uh, they all require energy so if the energy is that means uh, at each step at each step energy is required for this reason the synapse or synaptic transmission uh, gets fatigued in the nervous system it is not the nerve or either neither the presynaptic terminal nor the postsynaptic terminal it is at the synapse they get fatigued because synapse it has to perform so many functions or so many energy dependent functions so there is what is called a synaptic fatigue and uh, it is uh, an active activity dependent temporary depression of transmission of an impulse through the synapse so you just see that i have, I have mentioned activity dependent that means uh, if you are doing it very very frequently you are using the same thing same thing then you will get temporarily the synapse gets shuts down and this setting down of the uh, the synaptic activity is a protective one uh, trying to help itself uh, and uh, but it allows the impulse uh, it, it depresses the uh, impulse transmission further however this is a temporary one once you rest uh, it will come back to normal so what uh, what uh, what is the mechanism why there is a fatigability i have already said the fatigability is due to the energy de energy dependent because if you are talking about activity dependent that means energy required for each event so the loss loss of energy that's one part the second more uh, over and above the loss of energy so there is a uh, there is what is called exhaustion of the presynaptic uh, transmitter release that means the vesicles uh, uh, filled with uh, the presynaptic they are uh, definite the quantal quantal or uh, the what is called bernard cards mentioned about the quantal uh, release of these things and each presynaptic terminal have a definite amount of uh, or a quantity of the neurotransmitter uh, present for each action only n moles may be released but at the end of if this action is repeated several times all the uh, vesicles get emptied and uh, there will be nothing left of it so that is the exhaustion of the transmitter release from the uh, vesicles so that is one part so i have I, as i mentioned here it is a form of a short term synaptic plasticity so that means uh, it is trying to guard safeguard the in the activity of the synapse or uh, the bringing a adaptability of the synapse the plasticity is an adaptability and uh, it is a negative feedback control so that uh, excessive use of the particular synapse is prevented the second i have already mentioned the, this one i mentioned it is because of the exhaustion of the transmitter present in the vesicles then the this is uh, if we are thinking that this is in terms uh, of the presynaptic component the presynaptically there is a uh, exhaustion of the transmitter present in the vesicles but uh, we have to think that the exhaustion of the energy is also a component because uh, the energy is required for the movement of the vesicle bringing it to the membrane then releasing it then recycling it and uh, refilling it so all these things are happening so uh, it, the whole event or energy so i will just mention the energy also as an important aspect here the postsynaptic so looking at the postsynaptic side 
there would be a, a desensitization of the receptor, the, whatever the neurotransmitter receptor or the ion, ion channel. So that means uh, uh, if there is an excessive uh, presence of a neurotransmitter there in the synaptic cleft, so that would desensitize the receptors. That means a down regulation of the receptors or uh, down, down regulation of the ion channel activity. Then exhaustion of the catalytic enzymes. So, so a catalytic enzyme or uptake mechanism. So that means uh, uh, exhaustion of the, uh, say for example, here I am just trying to bring back, uh, if the uh, acetylcholine esterase, if it is uh, exhausted, acetylcholine remains in the synaptic cleft. And if the acetylcholine remains in the synaptic cleft, that is uh, uh, more, uh, it produces a more desensitization. That is one aspect. Uh, similarly, if I'm talking about a glutamate, because it is a, another another neurotransmitter, which is uh, um, reduced in the synaptic cleft by a reuptake mechanism. That means uh, it is taken up by the presynaptic terminal. And it is a sodium uh, and energy dependent process. And if this reuptake mechanism is not operative, which again, that requires the transporters, if it is not working, so glutamate uh, remains in the synaptic cleft and that produces a desensitization. So then the excess transmitter keep the membrane depolarized. That is another aspect. Suppose if there is an enormous amount of glutamate uh, which is not reuptaken, so then it depolarizes the membrane. If the membrane is depolarized, uh, then it is as good as in the refractory state. So that type uh, may, may result in uh, uh, the synaptic uh, fatigability. So it is a transient phenomena. If you rest or if you allow the synapse for some rest, it recovers. There is a refilling of the vesicles. There is the energy re-energization of the entire uh, uh, the machinery. So then the things come up. Resting facilitates the synthesis of neurotransmitter, restoration of the receptor, and the even uh, the energy storage. So this is about the fatigability or a synaptic fatigue. So this is one of the property of the uh, synapse. Number four, excitation and inhibition. So that means uh, synapse either may be an excitatory one or inhibitory one. So the, the production of the excitation or inhibition is dependent upon the post-synaptic uh, uh, electrical activity. This post synaptic this post synaptic electrical activity is brought about by either a depolarization or hyperpolarization. If there is a if it is a stimulatory, if it is producing an excitatory transmitter, it would produce a depolarization wave, what we call it as an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Which further leads to excited potential. I will explain in my subsequent slides. Similarly, if it is an inhibitory transmitter, uh, that would produce the hyperpolarization wave. And this hyperpolarization wave uh, makes the membrane uh, non-excitable. That means it remains at a below level of the threshold so that it will not allow the generation of the action potential. So thus, it prevents the uh, postsynaptic uh, uh, transmission. So this is about uh, uh, the each synapse has an ability to differentiate the transmitters either excitatory or inhibitory and this the transmitter excitatory or inhibitory is because of the presence of the EPSP or IPSP. Now what are they? I'm talking about excitatory postsynaptic potential and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay. So the neurotransmitter receptor interaction produces a wave of depolarization or hyperpolarization. So this is the wave of depolarization. I have drawn, I have drawn here. This is the wave of depolarization for a quantal release of neurotransmitters. So say for example, n moles of a neurotransmitter, this produces uh, this much, or uh, let us say one mole of uh, or one millimole of I, I cannot say one unit of uh, concentration of a, a neurotransmitter would produce this much amount of depolarization. Say, for example, this is minus 70 millivolts. Uh, this produces this much depolarization, maybe another uh, 10, 10 millivolts. So then we have a second uh, 
the n or uh, n plus one or n plus whatever n plus y uh, then you have this another wave of depolarization you can just see that and if you have a uh, the greater release of the transmitter it produces the the stronger depolarizing wave and if these these depolarizing waves one two three these depolarizing waves are known as excitatory postsynaptic potentials this happens in the postsynaptic side especially uh, this happens if you are trying trying to look at the uh, neuron at the initial segment of the neuron because the initial segment of the neuron reflects the entire neuronal activity now so this uh, when it reaches to a critical level the threshold level so that fires an excitation potential and once it fires an excitation potential the potential goes for a reversal so reversal means uh, it is a negative to positive so this is 0 millivolt here this is the minus here this is plus 30 somewhere around plus 30 so this will go to a sort of a uh, reversal potential this is a reversal potential now so if uh, that is the epsp when it reaches to a critical level that fires an excitation potential so the neurotransmitter receptor interaction produces a wave of depolarization that's known as epsp epsp is due to the movement of cations especially sodium or the potassium uh, sorry sodium or the calcium the potassium is moving from inside to outside that is so that is the epsp if epsp is due to the this is epsp you can just see these uh, whatever the waves i have made this is the with the n moles of a transmitter release the inhibitory transmitter say for example gaba if i apply n moles of a gaba so this gaba produces the amount of hyperpolarization and this amount of hyperpolarization peaks here and decays and uh, if the as i increase the quantity of the uh, uh, the transmitter so it will produce a greater hyperpolarization greater hyperpolarization however there is a limit for the inhibitory transmitter because you cannot there is no you cannot go go up to a particular point particular level because uh, there is a limit of the that is the limit of the membrane for that reason it reach, it flatters somewhere uh, after uh, minus uh, 90 or minus 100 millivolts uh, because 70 to 100 milli minus 100 millivolts 30 millivolt uh, that will come down and there will be a plateauing effect is seen so that is uh, the uh, about the ipsp so now because of this uh, membrane is hyperpolarized it takes a uh, uh, greater amount of depolarization to reach the threshold level thus it, the activity is inhibited so now this will happen because of the the tron that the gab because of the either movement of a chloride ion inside because the chloride and negatively charged ions they enter into these uh, anions they enter inside so that they will produce hyperpolarization or the potassium present a positive ion present within the cell is getting out that is a potassium efflux so that will also produce hyperpolarization so that means we have either a movement of chloride ion or potassium that would produce the hyperpolarization like that ipsp is due to the chloride or potassium flux and usually gaba is the transmitter glycine is also glycine is also produces the uh, chloride uh, influx now what is the common characteristic of the epsp or ipsp one there is no delay so that means it is the point where uh, the transmitter is applied and immediately it starts uh, producing depolarization similarly when you apply here immediately it starts producing hyperpolarization there is no latency in case of excitation potential there is latency if you are looking at excitation potential here you started here the excitation potential became operative here in this in this part so that means it is a, it has no latency the second thing it is graded you can just see that uh, as you increase the uh, quantity of the transmitter they will increase so these are graded potentials you can just see that so it depends upon the quantity of neurotransmitter released so then uh, third aspect 
these things can be summated. Say, for example, if I if I if I stimulate here, this produces this much amount of depolarization, and if I stimulate here, this depolarization get added up. So that means it is summated either temporally or spatially. I will come back in my next slide. So then you see here there will be a time-related decay. These are called uh, temporal and uh, uh, spatial constants. The time-related decay in the the uh, the hyper uh, depolarization or a hyperpolarization. Uh, happening in these. Uh, say, for example, if this is a uh, zero time here, this is one here, this is uh, a two here, there is a decay. Uh, this decay, half time, so it is happening uh, that is in relation to e raised to minus half or something like that. So you have a definite relation. So this is a, there is a decay, uh, temporal and uh, spatial constants by which it decays. This is all the uh, property of the general characteristics of the EPSP and IPSP. You may want to concentrate on this table um, when you are revising. One I have just made, what is EPSP? Excited report synaptic potential. What is IPSP? It is inhibitory post synaptic potential. What happens to the membrane? It depolarizes or it's the depolarization wave and it is a hyperpolarization wave. And what are the ion channels involved? It's the sodium channels or calcium channels in flux inside. And uh, in case of the IPSP, it is the chloride influx, the chloride entering in hyperpolarizing or potassium efflux, the potassium getting out. Then whether it produces the reversal of the potential. So I mentioned in, the, in my uh, previous, uh, this reversal of the potential, that means uh, uh, when, these, uh, when the excess potential takes place, it is from zero, from zero to plus 30 millivolts, it reaches uh, the reversal of potential uh, um, is seen here, or it is seen here in EPSP. It is not seen there in IP. IPSP because it is going down and there is no question of reversal. It is sitting there in the bottom. Okay. Now, action is it produces the EPSP is produced the reach the threshold and produce an excitation or the action potential. And uh, uh, in case of the IPSP, uh, it does not reach the threshold. There is an inhibition or no generation of action potential. The transmitters, all the excited transmitters you can talk about. You can you can list here. I'm just giving you glutamate, acetylcholine, uh, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, histamine, substance B, tachykinin, and so on. Whatever the transmitter I listed in my uh, last class. So it is uh, the inhibitory transmitters. What are those inhibitory transmitters? The GABA, the glycine, n kephalines 5-HT1 uh, at uh, the 5-HT at 5-HT1 receptors and acetylcholine at, at the M2 receptors. These are the inhibitory components. So you, you have to mention the 5-HT at 5-HT1 receptor, acetylcholine at the M2 receptors, they, they produce the inhibitory transmission. So that is uh, brought about by either uh, potassium or uh, chloride. Now, the common to both I have already mentioned. So these have a characteristics, no latency, they are graded. They can be summated temporally and spatially, and they exhibit a temporal and a spatial constants. Fifth property of the uh, synapse is the summation. A subthreshold stimulus will not produce action potential in the postsynaptic region. In the sense, a subthreshold stimulus will produce a sort of a, a depolarization wave depolarization wave in the postsynaptic side. But two or more subthreshold stimuli on the postsynaptic neuron can get added up to produce action potential. So there can be two types of summation possible. Maybe I'm explaining in the next slide the temporal and the spatial summation. That in the temporal summation, I will come back to this slide after seeing this here. So this is about the temporal summation I'm talking about. Here is a synapse I have drawn with my own hand. Uh, this is a presynaptic terminal, the presynaptic uh, neuron. And this is one neuron here to the soma with the dendrites, nucleus, 
and the initial segment. Here it makes a contact. When you have stimulated repeatedly, repeatedly, this is one stimulus here and another stimulus here. What happens? It produces an EPSV. And I have here I have drawn a bar that is a dashed line. It is the threshold level. So it produces the wave of depolarization, which is below the uh, sub, uh, sub threshold level. So that means each one of them are producing the same thing. Suppose uh, what happens uh, if I am decreasing the uh, time duration between these two stimuli. So I have decreased the time duration between these two stimuli here. When you stimulate it frequently, what happens? Uh, this first one produces this much amount of depolarization, whatever the amount. Then when you give the second one, this would add the amount of depolarization what is expected here, this, this amplitude. So it would try to produce the amount of depolarization. Suppose if it reaches the, the threshold level, so then what happens? You have the excentricity. This is what is called a summation. So that means uh, there is a, this is a, a summation in relation to time. That is what we call it as a temporal summation. And this temporal summation results in uh, the activity. That means a facilitation or uh, enhancement of the synaptic activity. If you are, if you just try to look at the uh, spatial summation, I have uh, uh, three nerve terminals here: N1, N2, and N3. So each one, when when stimulated, they will produce a wave of depolarization, which is subthreshold. I don't require to explain it again. This is the wave of the EPSP below the threshold level. N2 also produces the similar event. You can just see the N2 wave of depolarization. Again, it is sub-threshold. N3 also produces uh, this thing, a wave of depolarization. Suppose uh, if I simultaneously stimulate or if simultaneously all these N1 and N2 and N3 are activated, the wave of depolarization surpasses the threshold level and that fires the exit potential. This is a, a spatial summation. And here, what is happening? It is the synchronized, synchronized activity of the N1, N2, N3. Here, it is the uh, frequent, frequency at the same place. Place is same. Here, timing is same. So this is what I have written here. Temporal summation, presynaptic neurons stimulated uh, will be same but many stimuli are applied that means at frequent intervals in a rapid succession that means the frequency of stimuli is increasing but the place remains the same in a spatial summation the presynaptic neurons stimulated will be different but the stimuli will be applied simultaneously the frequency is same, but the places of stimulation will be different. As I mentioned here, places of stimulation, just for example, I have given N1 plus N2 plus N3. If you are looking at a, if you, if you are looking at a synapse, each neuron has a synapse more than 10,000 or even more, more synaptic things. And if all those, it is the, whatever happens here in the initial segment is the summation of all those activities, the inhibitory and excitatory activities happening here. So that is how it produces the uh, excellent potential. So this is a temporal summation and a spatial summation. So that's, uh, that makes it clear. And uh, maybe you can try to draw this diagram I have, I have just uh, made by myself. OK, then next uh, we will go to synaptic inhibition. There are five or six different types of inhibitions. One is the post-synaptic inhibition. That means uh, the inhibition happening at the synaptic. This is a post-synaptic membrane. That means uh, the inhibition, uh, the, this is the, uh, this is the uh, interneuron there. This will be the presynaptic, uh, this thing, and this will project on the post-synaptic membrane. It produces the inhibition here directly. And the, the, this one, you look here, this is one terminal coming down here and making a synaptic contact. And in the presynaptic junction, another synapse is located. This is a presynaptic um, uh, junction. That means another synapse is talking to the presynaptic junction. And this presynaptic junction, if something happens here, this may also be inhibited. 
this may be also be inhibited so that will have a different uh, pattern then feedback or a recurrent inhibition reciprocal inhibition feed forward inhibition lateral inhibition i will explain each one of them uh, briefly in the coming slides i have already explained so now we come back the postsynaptic inhibition so in the postsynaptic inhibition what happens this black one arrival of impulse in the presynaptic terminals release neurotransmitter here and the stimulation of the that means this this one this one is released this activates the internuncial this internuncial neuron this activates the internuncial neuron and this internuncial neuron uh, excitation potential is produced here and that would release the neurotransmitter here and this neurotransmitter uh, at the postsynaptic this is the this is motor neuron is the postsynaptic junction would uh, produce the influx of uh, chloride into the postsynaptic region so preferably i am i am talking about i am referring to the gabaergic neuron and this would produce the ipsp ipsp that is the hyperpolarization once there is a hyperpolarization the postsynaptic membrane is not ready to uh, be activated so no excitation potential in the postsynaptic neuron i have just uh, enumerated uh, 10 of those events so starting from the arrival of the impulse here activation of the intraniential cell the release of a transmitter and uh, the opening of the chloride channels and uh, the development of ipsp and uh, the membrane remains uh, hyperpolarized and no excitation potential this is the postsynaptic inhibition this is there in uh, in our uh, body these are uh, these are there now presynaptic inhibition we are trying to talk about how how the presynaptic inhibition works at so this is the uh, the one this is the synapse here this is the original synapse and uh, this is the presynaptic uh, neuron which is making a contact or interneuron making a connect with the contact with the presynaptic terminal the neurotransmitter released from the presynaptic neuron this is the presynaptic neuron it involves either a glycine or gaba or any other type of a neurotransmitter enkephalin or any other type of neurotransmitter so the amount of transmitter release is decreased so thus uh, the amount of transmitter released here from the presynaptic terminal is decreased so less excitable so that means a decrease dpsp amplitude will not be able to bring the postsynaptic region to threshold uh, state of stimulation the gaba ergic mechanisms uh, operate our glycinergic mechanisms are sitting there usually the glycine is the transmitter so this presynaptic is the glycine this is also concerned with the chloride ion channel and uh, uh, once this glycine uh, uh, happens so that that would um, uh, opens up the hyperpolarizes this membrane and then uh, that would not allow the uh, transmitter to be released from this thing so that means it it inhibits this uh, presynaptic junction but it is a postsynaptic for this postsynaptic inhibition but the presynaptic transmitter release is uh, decreased say for example here uh, glycine Uh, antagonist is strychnine. Strychnine is another poison. So the person who consumes these uh, strychnus uh, seeds, uh, these are alkaloids, uh, they will go into convulsions because uh, the inhibition, this uh, strychnine blocks this uh, glycinergic transmission. So that means uh, the inhibition is not there of the presynaptic. The motor neuron is not uh, inhibited, and it will keep on producing the contractions or the convulsions. now going further uh, about the feedback or a recurrent inhibition here i have made a, i have taken this diagram from the uh, genong uh, you just see that this is a motor neuron this sends the this is alpha motor neuron this sends the impulse to the uh, the muscle and this alpha motor neuron when when it gets out it gives a collateral this is a collateral here and this collateral will have another interneuron there and this interneuron has uh, uh, synaptic contacts with the uh, uh, direct synaptic contacts with the motor neuron so you just see that this is there this is stimulating this stimulates this here is the transmitter is acetylcholine this acetylcholine x and this is a, a rancha interneuron this is a rancha cell or golgi bottle cell uh, of the uh, rancha rancha interneuron and rancha interneuron in turn inhibits the motor 
this is inhibitory inhibitory neuron so the, there's a direct post synaptic contact and uh, uh, that uh, releases the GABA here so that means uh, this is a short known as a, a feedback or a recurrent inhibition a feedback that means uh, it is uh, the transmission is going there now it tries to prevent the motor neuron to be excited or giving more more and more uh, uh, inputs to the muscle for that reason it checks or uh, uh, makes the uh, uh, feedback uh, regulation so that no excessive activity takes place so this is a feedback or recurrent inhibition so this is uh, but at the same time it also inhibits the other motor neurons other motor neuron pools also okay so this is a lateral uh, this is short of a lateral inhibition. You just see that one neuron here and another neuron here. Uh, they are, they both are uh, getting it. Means so this is a lateral inhibition. This is one here and uh, a parallel or a lateral inhibition. What is reciprocal inhibition? We come back here. The reciprocal inhibition. You just see that uh, this is the quadriceps femoris muscle and this is the tendon. We elicit this reflex. When we excite this or when we tap here with the patellar tendon, so what happens, this stretches, this muscle gets stretched because of the tap, and this excites the uh, sensory um, components, uh, that is the muscle spindle. The sensory component are receptors present in the uh, muscle. These are uh, um, intrafusal fibers, what are called intrafusal fibers. Once they are excited, they send impulses. Uh, to the, they send impulses to the uh, spinal cord, and then they have a direct monosynaptic contact with the uh, with the uh, alpha motor neuron, which supplies this muscle. This is extrafusal fibers. This spring is a intrafusal fiber. This one, a triangle, is an extrafusal fiber. Now, what happens? It excites the extrafusal fiber to contract. Suppose if uh, uh, the quadriceps, uh, this muscle has to contract, this muscle has to relax, otherwise uh, the action is not there. Suppose if I have to flex, flex this uh, limb or upper limb here, and if I am using the biceps there, and uh, the triceps has to relax. Similarly, the agonist or uh, enter agonist group of muscle, when it is activated, the opponent or the antagonist group of muscle has to be relaxed. So this is what it does here. You have an interneuron here, and this interneuron is an inhibitory interneuron. It inhibits the, the antagonist group of muscles so that this muscle is relaxed. This type of inhibition is known as a reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition is for the purpose of making the mo motion uh, in, a, in an organized manner. So that means uh, if both of them contract, both flexor and extensor both contract, it becomes a rigidity and you cannot perform any work. So, so to prevent that type of event, we have this uh, reciprocal inhibition. Okay. So that means I have given you an example here, and this would be this one. You may have to. Uh, I will be coming with this diagram again and again in these things. This is a reciprocal inhibition. In reciprocal inhibition, impulse from presynaptic terminal will stimulate the motor neuron, supplying the agonist muscle. Okay, this will the agonist muscle, and through the interneuronal uh, neuron, this is the interneuron there, and. Uh, uh, it inhibits the motor neuron of the antagonist muscle. This is the antagonist muscle. This is the uh, biceps femoris. That is the flexor muscle of the uh, thigh. So th that's how it relaxes. So that uh, this action of this thing remains. Uh, uh, it can be possible. If it contracts, it relaxes. They, there is a movement of the limb. Now, then we, we go with the feet forward inhibition. I will just uh, quickly go through this thing. It is the cerebellar diagram. I will not go into the detail here. We have uh, uh, the granular cell, granular cell in the cerebellum, wherein it receives inputs uh, uh, from various parts of the body. And these inputs, uh, when they stimulate the granular cell, they will have a, a synaptic contact with what are called the basket cell and the stillet cell. Stillet cells are not shown here. And these stillet cells uh, inhibit the Purkinje cell. The purpose of the granular cell, it will excite the Purkinje cell, Purkinje cell, 
and then that would inhibit. So the excitation of the Purkinje cell that is a um, it is uh, happening there. And before the excitation, it is exciting the basket cell. It is inhibiting. This is a feed forward inhibition. At this time, it is exciting here. And uh, this one exciting here, it is trying to feed forward. So that means it is a, a short checking, checking the actions uh, so that our actions are having, do not have the overshoot. Our actions are very controlled. So this is a, a feed forward inhibition is for a control and of our movements or actions. So that means there is no overshoot of the actions. So now lateral inhibition. This impulse is going here through this neuron. Through this neuron impulse is going here. And this would activate the, the, the neurons by the side. So that means these neurons by the sides are inhibited so that there is a what is called a, a lateral inhibition so that projection of the particular thing and it is a very much useful very much useful in case of a visual system visual system if all the cones are excited so then there will be a glare so you don't see anything any image at all to see that it to be focused with a particular image so the lateral cones have to be inhibited and the center one only be forwarding the information so this is a lateral inhibition now coming back to the the seventh property of the synapse it is a facilitation and desensitization the facilitation and desensitization usually the synapses they they are facilitated or desensitized here I am giving you an example following a, a titanic stimulation. Titanic stimulation is the stimulation at a frequent intervals. That means at a frequent intervals, if you uh, stimulate, it is called a titanic intervals. Titanus is a disease. A titanic stimulation is different. Titanic stimulation is a, a stimulation of a nerve or excitable membrane at a, at a higher frequency. When we are doing with a higher frequency, there is an increased responsiveness of the uh, postsynaptic membrane. And this is known as a facilitation. So that means if you frequently stimulate the postsynaptic membrane, become more, the, the synapse becomes more responsive. So this is facilitation. This is known as a post-titanic potentiation. So that means uh, uh, when we keep doing work, working, keep working and working, finally we become efficient even when we are at a high, high rate. So this is due to increased calcium availability at the presynaptic terminal, the vesicle, vesicle movement, vesicle transport, exocytosis happening effectively, or it may be due to the increased sensitivity of the receptor. That means the uh, new neurotransmitter and the receptor interaction. It is because of the increased sensitivity of the receptor or upper regulation of the receptor that would take up the, there will be more receptors coming up. So that means that there is, a, there is increased sensitivity. Or even after receptor is the, um, the intracellular signaling. So the amplification of the intracellular signaling, say for example, adenyl cyclase activity or cyclic AMP activity is amplified or inositol triphosphate activity or any other activity which is uh, uh, modulating the ion channels that is amplified. Or it may be due to the activation of the reverberating circuits. Reverberating circuits, I, I will talk about. These are circuits go, come and again and again and again they stimulate, maybe because of the reverberating circuits. Or it is because of the activation of other neuromodulators. So that means something else is cropping up that itself has, do not have a, uh, the main action, but the neuromodulator will sensitize. These are uh, five events that may be responsible for the facilitation. Uh, may be true for the desensitization in the other direction okay now we come back here this is what is happening with the facilitation you can just see that this facilitation there is a there is an increase in the epsp epsp level even the uh, excel potential is uh, prolonged the wave of depolarization is prolonged you can have this thing this is the presynaptic uh, this has been attributed to the uh, calcium uh, increased calcium influx now, coming back to the desensitization, 
I, in, the, in the previous slide, we talked about the uh, facilitation. The following tetanic stimulation, there is a decrease uh, responsiveness of the postsynaptic terminal. This is known as a desensitization or post-tetanic depression. It is again due to the calcium, decreased calcium availability. That means uh, the calcium is getting lost, calcium getting sequestrated, or calcium is getting uh, uh, lost in the cytoplasm, or at the presynaptic uh, terminal, there is a sequestration of the calcium. So if the sequestration of the calcium, it is not available for a membrane transport, it's not available for the vesicular uh, mechanisms. The, that means this in decrease, or it may be due to the decrease in the sensitivity of the receptors as such. So that means a down regulation of the receptors. Or it may be suppressing the intracellular signaling uh, pathways, the cyclic adenyl cyclase, cyclic AMP, or uh, other uh, pathways. Or it may be decreased activation of the inhibitory circuits. Or activation of other inhibitory uh, neuromodulators. All these things could be possible for desensitization, occlusion in the subliminal fringe. I have a, a two, three synapses. One A, B, C. This is one set of neurons. X, Y, Z are another set of neurons. A makes a synaptic contact with A, X. B makes synaptic contact with X and Y. C makes synaptic contact with Y and Z. So now, what happens if you stimulate A, this would stimulate one other, another set of neuron there and it will produce a, a sub-threshold response or sub-threshold EPSP in the X. B produces sub-threshold responses in X and Y. C produces Y and Z. Suppose if I stimulate A and B together, a, I'm, I'm just stimulating A, that would produce sub-threshold here, and a B, that produces sub-threshold here. And this is stimulation of a two sub-threshold things sir, would excite the X, that is facilitation. That is facilitation, that is the activation of these things. Otherwise, it is not, it's dormant. Now, what is happening here in Y, in Y, the B, because of the B stimulation, because I have stimulated A and B, and the B stimulation has produced a response here in X, but in the Y, there is a, some amount of already, it is sensitized to the Y, and this sensitization of the Y, because of the uh, collateral activation, this is a subliminal fringe. Suppose if this Y, if C is stimulated, Y gets activated, so that is another thing. So that means B activation leads to X and Y. Suppose if I repeatedly, repeatedly stimulate the B or uh, excess, uh, the frequent stimulation, it would activate both X and Y. C activation will produce the Y and Z. Suppose if I stimulate both B and C neurons, B and C neurons are activated then what we will get, uh, we will get only three X, Y, Z. The B is stimulating two, C is stimulating two, but the both the stimulation of a B and C will stimulate only three neurons. So now one, one neuronal activity or there's a loss in that, uh, that means that there is no other neuron, there's a, there's a decreased performance. Both of these things decreased, this is called a here I have mentioned subliminal fringe, subliminal fringe, what is happening in Y when it is producing a response in X and uh, when we stimulated B and C, that is uh, the occlusion process because uh, B alone will stimulate two units, C alone will stimulate two units, B and C together will, will stimulate only three units. So, so that means there is a uh, occlusion of one unit because uh, it's shared by common. This is about the occlusion and a subliminal fringe. Convergence and divergence.
the impulse is from uh, one presynaptic nerve if if i am going back here if you if you look here uh, the nerve terminal uh, see that means uh, you have a number of uh, nerve terminals they converge upon a single here one two three four so even thousand thousands of them they are there in a motor neuron so that means they are receiving inputs from all all from the spinal cord descending tracts so so on this is convergence on one then this alpha motor neuron activity is generated so this is a convergence so now this is a divergence say for, for example one neuron now activating uh, here two neurons these are activating so that means it is spreading this is a convergence is focusing diverging means it is uh, spreading to the collateral area so now uh, what uh, this is uh, same thing happening here the uh, whole thing is getting uh, going up so these these, these events uh, so convergence refers to phenomena of a termination of a signal from many sources that is focusing divergence that is the spread of the inputs to the uh, the variety of uh, neuronal cells now one more thing so the reverberating circuits which i have not drawn here reverberating circuits in which uh, what happens uh, uh, this neuron uh, uh, gets activated and uh, they, this will activate another neuron uh, say, say for example if i if this is a neuron activated that this will activate another neuron there and this activate another neuron and it comes back and activate this thing so that means you have two or three synapses so like that so you have you may have a, a number of uh, number of items coming up I, I forgot to make that diagram maybe in the next class i may, I may try to bring in that diagram so that means this keeps on activating the reverberating uh, so reverberating uh, connection so that means one after another so that means you will not the, the, the this main synapse will not forget about these things uh, such circuits are there in the peptide circuit uh, that's in the uh, the mammalothalamic tract uh, mammalothalamic tract in the uh, limbic system so that uh, whatever we we do not tend to forget certain things uh, that we keep on keep on remembering the, these things so that is a reverberating circuits now synaptic plasticity synaptic plasticity is the ability of the neural tissue to change as required and this is reflected as long-term potentiation that is the increased effectiveness of the synaptic activity that means the potentiation is a way of depolarization increased uh, excitability of the, the synaptic activity or uh, depression that is a long-term depression this is a part of the synaptic plasticity and this is very important for learning and memory synaptic plasticity is not only the electrophysiological event it may be a morphological event so that means it may result in the growth of the dendrite dendritic carburizations or a dendritic spine formation or the expression of the new receptors or the uh, overall the effectiveness of the uh, total synaptic transmission enhancement or uh, uh, the efficiency of the total transmission is uh, uh, done by the synaptic plasticity long-term potentiation is a part of the synaptic uh, uh, plasticity developing a persistent uh, enhancement of the postsynaptic potential response to presynaptic stimulation after a brief period of rapidly stimulated stimulation of the presynaptic neuron it resembles post tetanic potentiation but it is much more prolonged than the postsynaptic potentiation post tetanic potentiation and it can last for days it is uh, the basis for our memory and the learning unlike post-tetanic potentiation it is initiated an increase in the intracellular calcium level in the post-synaptic site in case of ptp it is the pre-synaptic pre neuron that is happening in case of um, long-term potentiation it is happening in the post-synaptic neuron it occurs in many parts of the nervous system especially the the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex uh, where learning and memory are uh, last, last, largely involved, even the motor cortex and the cerebellum, but has been studied in great detail in the hippocampus. 
and this long term potentiation involves a number of intracellular signaling uh, molecules or pathways and uh, i have just listed only cyclic amp and uh, there will be a number of uh, cyclic amp or uh, inositol triphosphate or calcium uh, uh, mediated uh, signaling uh, pathways then long term depression is opposite of that long term potentiation it is seen uh, in the hippocampus again and uh, it is opposite of ltp it resembles ltp in many ways but it is characterized by decrease in synaptic strength that means elimination we try to be wiser by not doing certain things it is produced by slower stimulation of the presynaptic uh, neurons and associated with a smaller rise in intracellular calcium again calcium has been implicated here involved again this is also involved in learning and memory uh, just uh, uh, as used in the ltp because uh, our learning and memory is not only the excitation all the time it is also inhibition so that we effectively perform our actions the clinical aspects the synaptic pharmacology or synaptic the mo or modulated synaptic uh, uh, transmission has been implicated in number of diseases so if parkinsonism is the disease in which uh, the um, the dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia are lost that's for parkinsonism that means transmission alzheimer's disease alzheimer's disease the cholinergic neurons they are lost cholinergic neurotransmission even huntington disease i have not mentioned here huntington disease is again loss of the gabaergic neurons uh in the basal ganglia depression may be monoaminergic neurons or the serotonergic neurons anxiety the monoaminergic neurons schizophrenia monoaminergic neurons all these things are the alteration in the synaptic transmission in a particular uh, uh, transmitters uh, they are in world this is the clinical aspect now uh, what i what i have done here for the assignment for you uh, i have given two full questions one this one is uh, very frequently asked what is synapse describe the properties of synapse i have listed uh, nearly 12 properties you can just uh, try to describe each of them describe the types of synaptic inhibition i mentioned six uh, six types of synaptic inhibition give a detailed account on the pre and post synaptic inhibition that's what uh, i want now i have just uh, given a short note on synaptic inhibition subliminal fringe synaptic occlusion post tetanic potentiation post synaptic inhibition uh, pre synaptic inhibition divergence convergence of synapse synaptic fatigability ltp synaptic plasticity uh, these are reference books the candles the gaitam gaitam textbook of medical physiology kenang's review and uh, samson rice of medical physiology okay uh, what we will do we will move on to the from the nerve we have come to the synapse now we will reach to the spinal cord we will see how the spinal cord is organized